And in episode eight, Anthony picks up Kate and rushes her back to the house. The doctor immediately starts to tan- but Anthony is beside himself. That's because he truly loves Kate, and he doesn't know if she's going to be all right or not. To make matters worse, he feels like it's his fault that she's lying there. So he ends up storming out of the house. Days later, Kate still has not woken up. And neither has Lady Whistledown. She hasn't written since her previous post about Eloise. To quote Penelope, Lady Whistledown is done ruining the lives of others. And Penelope wants to go visit her friend. She wants to see how she's doing. But Lady Featherington tells her, you are not to step foot in that household. She then gets an update from Lord Featherington about how close the deal with Colin is. It's very close. Because of this, Lady Featherington wants to throw a big celebration. She's going to throw a ball. And she's going to call it the Featherington Ball. Very creative. She's going to invite the entire town, including the Bridgertons and the Sharmas. She figures, worst case scenario, they don't show up. Best case scenario, they do. And the drama will ensue. Down the street, a ball is the farthest thing on the Bridgerton's mind. Lady Bridgerton continues to send flowers to Kate's bedside. But then Anthony walks in the room like a tornado. That's because he was recently doing the books and saw that Colin took out a sizable amount of money. Forces Colin to admit that he is thinking about doing an investment with Lord Featherington. Anthony flips out, and when Eloise and Benedict come to Colin's defense, he insults them. He basically insults everybody in the room until eventually they all get up and leave. Everybody except his mother. She's worried about him. He has yet to visit Kate. And while he says he doesn't have the time, she thinks he should make time. Later that day, the Bridgertons get a package delivered to him, but it's surprisingly for Eloise. When Eloise opens it up, it's books. And there's a handwritten note inside from Theo. He admits in the note that he knew that Lady Whistledown was using the printing shop to print her pamphlets. And that pisses off Eloise. She covertly heads to the printing press, but Theo explains, I couldn't tell you. I didn't know she was still watching me, but she's taking her business elsewhere. I didn't want to end things with you, but I also didn't want her to see the two of us together. I thought if she did, she'd write cruelly of you, which Eloise points out. A little late for that. Eloise doesn't really care about apologies from Theo. She wants to know who Whistledown is. So she tells him, I want to know everything you know. He tells her the manuscripts came twice a week and they were sewn in silks. There's only one person that could possibly be, and it's the modiste. After leaving the printing press, she heads to go visit with Madame Delacroix. She accuses her of working with Whistledown, and Madame Delacroix is taken off guard but also denies it, knowing full well that Eloise doesn't really have any hard evidence. It is making Madame Delacroix extremely uncomfortable, though. Luckily for her, the conversation is interrupted when the Featheringtons walk in. But when Penelope sees Eloise talking with Madame Delacroix, she has an idea of what it could be about. She pulls Eloise outside, where Eloise tells Penelope that the print shop where Theo worked was where Whistledown printed her pamphlets. She is positive that she is well on her way to finding the true identity of Whistledown. Penelope then reveals to Eloise that there has been gossip of her talking to Theo for weeks. Eloise Bridgerton, a man from the lower class, and by Lady Whistledown not writing, she's doing Eloise a favor. All of this takes Eloise completely off guard because she thought she was being discreet. Penelope tells Eloise that she is sick of hearing about Whistledown because Eloise has been obsessed. She has to move on. But this plea is more so in hopes that Eloise does move on so she doesn't find out that Lady Whistledown is her. She doesn't listen. That night, she heads to the printing press, and along with Theo, she starts combing over documents looking for any clues that could lead her to the true identity of Whistledown. When a bunch of papers fall, the two get down and pick them up, but they get really close to each other. Eloise doesn't know quite what to do, so she tells Theo, this whole thing, we can't do that. We can't meet like this anymore. He reminds her that this was her idea, and as she's packing up all of the Whistledown letters, she starts apologizing to him for wasting his time. He asks her, are you, or are you dropping out of this for other reasons? She tells Theo that people are already talking about them, and because of that, she has to leave. She couldn't live with herself if Theo was the one who had to face the consequences of their relationship. Theo doesn't take it well. He says, it's okay. You dipped your toes into my waters trying to make yourself feel better about the advantages of your birth. Now you can go back to your life and I can go back to mine. You hate to see young love end so soon. But the lack of Whistledown's pamphlets are leaving the town thirsty for information and gossip. Mainly, the queen. She calls Lady Danbury because she is curious as to why the wedding didn't take place. Danbury, however, tells the queen... I'm not sure. We're all just worried about Kate at the moment. 
But if Lady Whistledown were currently writing, she might be writing about the scheme that is going on with the Featheringtons. Okay, probably not because that would affect Penelope Featherington, but I needed a segue. This is it. That night, Lord Featherington meets up with Colin at Mondrich's Gentleman's Club to seal the deal. Even though his wife tells him don't get involved, Mondrich can't help himself. He knows that Featherington is running a scheme, and he wants to warn Colin about it. He tells Colin, this dude is a swindler. It's a trait that he shares with his cousin. I got wrapped up in it, and I'm not proud of it, but I don't want you to. But to Mondrich's surprise, Colin stands up and defends the Featheringtons, telling Mondrich that he should mind his own business, and this is probably why he has nobody in his gentleman's club. And then he tells Featherington, let's take our business elsewhere. After further talks, Lord Featherington comes home victorious. He bursts through Lady Featherington's bedroom door and says, Colin Bridgerton is taking the bait. But there is an issue. He tells Lady Featherington, we've basically exhausted the entire town, and eventually they're going to want some return on their investment. We're not going to have it. We should think about heading back to the Americas. Lady Featherington has no interest in that whatsoever, but Lord Featherington sells it to her that she could be the Queen of America. They then get dangerously close to kissing until Lord Featherington actually pulls away. And it seems like he's leaving Lady Featherington wanting a little bit more. The next day, with Edwina by her side, Kate finally wakes up. At this point, Edwina has forgiven her sister for what happened. A close call with death will do that. When Kate wakes up, Edwina is beside herself in glee. They let her know that Lord Bridgerton was the one who rescued her. But when she asks, has he visited me since, they have to say, no, he hasn't. Word of Kate waking up quickly spreads throughout the town, and Lady Bridgerton rushes in to tell her son. As soon as Antony finds out that Kate is okay, he starts crying. He is so relieved. Then Lady Bridgerton starts crying because she starts apologizing to Antony for the fact that it was he who was with his father the day that he died. And it was he who had to look after the family while she was in mourning. When there's a lull in the conversation, Antony tells his mother, I don't know if I can go visit her. And Lady Bridgerton tells her son, losing your father was the toughest moment of my life. But I take solace in knowing that I would still marry him every single day of the week. I would feel the same pain I felt all over again just to spend five minutes with him. That is real, true love. Do not lose her, Antony. So Antony heads on over. After they get some pleasantries out of the way, he tells her that that morning he showed up looking to propose. He then pulls out the ring, but to his surprise, she says, I'm returning to India. The moment I figure stuff out with Edwina, I'm gone. Lady Danbury has offered to sponsor my mother and my sister for another season. To become clear, I'm no help. He tells her that she's running away, and she tells him to go. The next morning, Kate actually makes it out of bed. The first person she goes to visit is Edwina. She tells her, I know that earning back your trust isn't going to be easy, but I'm willing to try. Edwina then starts asking the tough questions to Kate about Kate and Antony's relationship, and Kate is honest with her. She wasn't lying to Edwina, she was lying to herself. Both women then agree to go to the Featherington Ball that night. But later in the night, Kate starts getting cold feet. She doesn't even know if she wants to go. And when Lady Mary walks into her room and Kate tells her, I don't know if I'm going to this thing, Lady Mary says, I really hope that's not because you want to flee from what's difficult. I know this feeling. It's never the wise choice. Kate starts crying and Lady Mary reminds her, Edwina forgave you. I forgave you. But Kate cuts her off and says, I didn't forgive myself. The conversation goes into what burden Kate had to deal with as Lady Mary was grieving her husband. And Lady Mary points out, that was your father. You had already lost your mother. This prompts Kate to mention that Lady Mary took her in and treated her no different than Edwina. She felt like she owed her. And Lady Mary says, you owed me nothing. You never had to earn your place in this family. I loved you from the day I met you. And love is not something that is owed. You came into my life as a daughter. And I never saw you as anything else. It makes me sad to think that you think that you don't deserve love in this world. Kate then tells Lady Mary about Antony coming and proposing to her that day. She says, I couldn't say yes. He was asking me out of mere obligation after the two of us, but she stops herself. Kate tells her mother, I don't think he loves me. Both women are crying and they give each other a hug. And Benedict has returned home for that ball. But it's not just for that reason. He found out that Antony had made a sizable donation to the art school on his behalf. And that's what got him in, not his merit. He got so mad that he left school. The first person he sees when he gets home is a very sad Eloise Bridgerton. 
She looks like she went through heartbreak. So Benedict sits by her side. He reveals to his sister why he left the academy. And she tells him, that doesn't mean that you wouldn't have been accepted on your own. She tells her brother that she really doesn't want to go to this ball. So Benedict says, I'll escort you. Back in the house upstairs, Anthony is just sitting with his thoughts about what went down that day when Gregory walks in. He had a tough day with his Latin teacher, but then he notices a painting of his father. And he tells Anthony that he didn't even know his father. That causes him to ask Anthony, what was father like? And Anthony is telling Gregory all about their dad, while they unknowingly are getting eavesdropped by their mother. A little while later, everybody heads off to the ball, and this is a big ball that the Featheringtons are throwing. The queen even arrives. It gets a little awkward when Eloise shows up and finds Penelope. They don't really know what to talk about, but eventually Eloise reveals to Penelope that she was right about Theo. It was a mistake ever getting involved with him. She thanks Penn for being a really good friend. But then Penn pulls her aside and starts pointing out all of the gossipy things that she's witnessed that night. And Eloise recognizes the words. It's at that moment that Eloise has figured out who Lady Whistledown is. But she doesn't call her friend on it right away. She needs proof. So she covertly heads up to her bedroom and starts looking for it. While Eloise is looking for the proof she needs, the Sharmas show up and they start dancing like nobody's watching. Two other people who are dancing with each other are Colin and Cressida. Cressida is wearing one of Jack's ruby necklaces that he gifted her. And Colin says, there's a problem with it. Your clasp is broken. All right, I'll fix it. He then goes over and grabs Penn and they go into a separate room. And they're alone, so it's very taboo. He tells Penelope, I've looked into your cousin and I think he's a scam artist. Before he can even explain himself, Lady and Lord Featherington come through the door and demand to know what is going on. But Colin isn't going to let Lady Featherington guilt trip him into a marriage like she did with Lord Featherington and Prudence. He puts down the necklace and smashes it, proving that it's nothing more than glass. He calls Lord Featherington out on the fact that he's running a scam and demands that he return all the money. But the one thing he doesn't do is blame the Featherington women. Because the one thing that Colin has wrong is the fact that Lord Featherington is, quote, taking advantage of them because they don't have a father or a husband to protect them. Colin and Penelope then leave the room. And once they do, Lord Featherington tells Lady Featherington, the money is packed. We got to leave for America tonight. She asks him, what am I going to do about my daughters? And he says, we'll send for them after, or they can come with us. But in some ways, this will be a relief. I'm not going to have to go through my proposed marriage to Prudence. There'll be other possibilities. And then he kisses her. Outside on the dance floor, Penelope and Colin are dancing their little hearts out. Penelope is absolutely swooning over Colin. And when Colin tells her, I'll always look after you, Penn. You are special to me. She's about ready to jump into bed with him right then and there. She is riding high. She heads up to her room with the biggest cheesing smile on her face. But it quickly vanishes when she opens up her door to see that her place has been ransacked. And there's Eloise Bridgerton. She's found the whistle down notes and she's found all the money. She feels completely betrayed. Penelope has no choice but to admit to it. But it's hard to really sell to your friend The reason why you wrote those nasty things in the last edition of Whistledown was to protect her. The two women say some things to each other that they'll probably want back. And Eloise leaves Penelope crying. Eloise heads back downstairs to the ball where Edwina and Kate find themselves on the sidelines. And Kate cannot take her eyes off of Antony. Edwina says, you're not going to be able to avoid him all night. And you shouldn't try to. Not on my behalf. She all but pushes her sister into Bridgerton's arms. Antony starts talking about maybe they should keep their distance, but she says, maybe I shouldn't. So they start dancing to a classical version of Wrecking Ball, which is an all-time banger. But everybody is basically staring at them. It's quite scandalous, which is something that Lady Cowper mentions. People near the Queen start asking if that's why Edwina had abandoned Antony on her wedding day. And without Lady Whistledown writing anything, the Queen lies, saying, Oh, no, child, that wedding didn't take place because I didn't want it to. Edwina then does her part, steps forward and says, I think they look beautiful. And the queen agrees. She then looks Edwina up and down and asks, have I told you about my nephew? He's a prince. So there might be still hope for Edwina yet. When the song is over, the queen walks by the two, gives an approving nod, but then everybody has to head out because there's more entertainment outside. Fireworks. But when the entire place is cleared out, Lord Featherington turns to Lady Featherington and says, this is great. Let's go. But she says no. I've had the help pack your bags, and I've given you enough money to get to the States. So here's how this is going to work. You're going to leave, and we're going to say that we were scammed. You took everybody's money, and you ran. We keep our dignity, but we get rid of you. 
This completely takes Lord Featherington off guard. After all, they were a team. But she points out, no one's going to believe that Lord Featherington needed a woman's help to construct this master plan. And she already has a team. It's her three daughters. Lady Featherington is going to survive on the rest of the money they scammed everybody out of. It's a perfect plan. Lord Featherington knows it. He has no choice but to leave. She also had Farley forge his signature on a document stating that as soon as one of her girls has a son, the estate is going to pass to him. So score one for Lady Featherington. One of those three daughters is having a tough night, and it's about to get more difficult for her. Penelope heads out in the garden, and she overhears a bunch of the guys laughing, and that includes Colin. Lord Fife tells Colin, I saw you dancing with Penelope Featherington. Is there anything there? And she overhears Colin say, No, I would never dream of courting Penelope Featherington. Not in your wildest fantasies would I do that. So she lost her best friend, and she lost the love of her life. After the ball, Colin has something to do, though. He needs to make amends. He brings all of his buddies over to Mondrich's Gentleman's Club and apologizes to Mondrich for how he acted, but explains that he needed to do so to earn Lord Featherington's trust. To show a debt of gratitude, he told all of his buddies that this is a place that is run by an honorable man. His brothers, though, are still back at the party. Benedict walks up to Antony before the fireworks set off, and he tells him, I left the academy. I found out what you did. You were trying to help, but it was misguided. You sensed the truth, which is, I'm simply not good enough. Antony cuts him off and says, Benedict, you're beginning to sound like me. If you want to paint, paint. It's one of your many talents. Another one is you're able to see what people need before they see it themselves. He's talking about his relationship with Kate. Benedict saw it long ago. He thanks his brother for trying to show him the light, but he is unable to return the favor. Benedict does end up leaving the academy. Antony then goes off and tries to find Kate. He asks her if she's still planning to leave for India, and the answer to that is yes. He makes the pitch that she should marry him, And at first she fights it, but eventually she gives in. They share a lovely kiss under the fireworks, and not too long later, they're man and wife enjoying another rousing game of croquet, or whatever the hell you want to call it. And that is the end of Bridgerton Season 2. Thank you so much for checking out this recap. Please consider subscribing to the channel. Hit thumbs up if you like this. Smash that thumbs down button if you thought this sucked. If you leave a comment in the comment section and I don't get back to it, don't take it personally. I usually avoid the comment section because when people point out that one mistake that you made, i.e. forgetting the one Bridgerton daughter that never shows up in the show, it just pisses me off. So I just avoid it at all costs. But I do appreciate you stopping by. Also, I have merch. Go buy a t-shirt. I have bills to pay.